Blessed be God's glorious name forever, and may all the earth be filled with the glory of the Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Northmont Church. May you feel a touch of the Holy Spirit as you worship with us this morning. Did I say smorning? I did. <clears throat> this morning? Good. Now we could always say smorning. That would be fun. A um, couple of things coming up. Our coat drive continues. The box downstairs by the water fountain is beginning to overflow. Thank you. Keep up the good work. If you have a coat that you no longer need, please feel free to donate it so that somebody who does not have a coat may have one. Any size, children's size, adult sizes, infant sizes, we'll take it all. A confirmation class will continue right after worship. Youth group has changed. They will now begin meeting at 4.30 in this afternoon, and that includes the confirmation class if they would like to join the youth. Um, which brings me to Steph Martin, our brand new youth person who is not here today until 4.30 because she, for the last two weeks since she's been with us, she has also been at Hampton Presbyterian Church. She's been at two churches at once. Today they are giving her a farewell at all three services this morning. So she won't be here until this afternoon. Um, next week, Reverend Silas Ingjozano and Reverend Bill Paul will be preaching. Um, Reverend, Reverend Ingjozano from Malawi will be our special guest for the day, and I know that you will make him very welcome. Speaking of welcoming, it's a month away, but Northmont is hosting the Thanksgiving Eve service. This is a for church participation service. St. Alexis is joining us, that's new. We also have um, uh, Ingomar and uh, St. John Newman and Northmont have been doing this for years. It's our turn to host. It would be lovely if you would A, participate, B, possibly bring a dish for the fellowship afterwards. Um, finger food cookies, bars, brownies, something that people could just easily pick up. Most of us don't want to be doing dishes down in the hall the night before Thanksgiving, where we'll be doing dishes all day long. Mark, you have something to say to us? <laughs> yes. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, a lot of logistics today, that's all I'm, I'm up here for. Uh, first of all, today, I hope you didn't bring your ticket, right? Uh, it's going to be a wonderful sermon, and I'm looking forward to that. Think about what you will be putting on your commitment card. We will be turning these in um, next Sunday during the service. If you've already turned it in, thank you so very much. We do have them, and you may have already or will be about to receive another letter in the mail. If you've already turned yours in, it's still coming to you. Still take a look at it, but everybody else, read it over, think about it, and uh, try to make your decision, and think about what God wants you to put, I should say, on to this commitment card. Make sure that you bring them next week. We also have the statements. We handed out most of them last week. Jack Swig still has a few more. Find us in the back. Find me in the back after church if you have not received it. But it's just your statement of giving just to kind of help you understand where you are in the process uh, of, of fulfilling the commitment that you made earlier last year. So enjoy today's sermon, which I'm sure you always will. This make sure morning. This morning. And make sure that next morning you bring <laughs> your commitment cards. Thanks a lot, guys. It would be lovely to remember, be remembered by something other than this morning. <laughs> Which is why we now turn our hearts and our minds to the praise of our God by standing and greeting one another with the love of Christ.
please stand as you are able for the call to worship. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. Let us worship our God. Tender and compassionate God, whose strength is made imperfect in our weakness, help us to know that you receive us as we are. Help us, imperfect though we are, to be carriers of the message of your love. May we worship you in spirit and in truth, through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. seated. It is God who leads us into prayer and meets us in the prayer. Let us pray together. Patient God, we are so easily distracted from what you would have us be and what you would have us do. 
We allow ourselves to be claimed by the angry and hurting world as though we bore a stamp reflecting the hostility. You remind us that, from the beginning, your love has been available to us. Forgive us when we so easily turn toward ignorance and greed as ways of living in the world. Heal our wounded souls. Challenge us to be your people, not owned by false promises of instant wealth and status, but strengthened and empowered to be those who bring hope through words and actions. In Jesus' name we pray. The good news is sure. God's love prevails and moves through us with the joy of forgiveness and cleansing. Thanks be to God. Amen. seated. Would the children like to come forward? How are you this morning? Grateful. Grateful. <laughs> Thank you. This Morning. Yes, I don't know where my head was yet. Girl Scouts? Why Girl Scouts? Oh, fun. All right, so you have a party this evening. Anybody else have something you are looking forward to in the near future? You might have? All right. What happens? So put something in your mind of something you would really, really like to do. Do you have something that you're looking forward to? What's going to happen in two weeks? You're going to Disneyland or Disney World? Yay. I'd recommend trying the other one too. California is a great place, but let's not go there. What if your plans, your plans, your plans, which you didn't say, your plans that you're thinking of, were interrupted by a rejection. Something you're looking forward to, something you're used to maybe, something that might be brand new, it's a big deal to you, and somebody went, oh no, not you. Really, can we get a picture of this face? It's perfect. Really, what? How does it feel to be rejected? It doesn't feel good, it feels awful. All right, now I need you to picture in your head, I know you have seen this at school or someplace else, I pray you have never seen it at church, but I want you to think of a situation where you watch somebody, whether you knew them or not, get rejected. Oh no, not you. You know. Any chance in a sports team, somebody gets picked last, which is always a rejection of sorts. Have it, has it happened? Hurts, doesn't feel good at all. Or a birthday party and everybody has an invitation, but not you. Ouch. I don't answer this. Have you rejected somebody else? It hurts to be rejected. I think I'm going to be accurate when I say most people out there and there and there have felt the sting of one rejection or another sometime in their life. The question is, when it happens to you, what will you do with it? Will you turn that rejection on the rejector 
and become a rejecter yourself? It's very tempting. You rejected me, guess what? I'm going to reject you. It is normal to do that. But I want to give you an example of somebody who was seriously rejected, and his name was Jesus. He came home to preach. He, his ministry had just begun. He was of the right age to preach in his home synagogue, which is like a church. He preached, and everybody knew him. Hey, this is Joseph's son, the carpenter. <laughs> That's our boy. Boy, can he preach. And then he said something they didn't like. Instead of saying, you, my home congregation, you are God's only accepted people, Jesus used examples of people outside of his own people. You probably heard of General Naaman. Mm -hmm. He's one mean person. God touched him with a special healing. And a woman who doesn't even have a name but didn't live in Israel. God touched her with a special gift. Jesus basically said to his home congregation, it's not just you. It's everybody who's invited. And do you know that his home congregation said, no. In fact, they tried to kind of throw him off a cliff. They chased him out of town. But he being Jesus was rather deft at saying, you know, I understand you're mad, but I'm not going to let you do what you want to do nor am I ever going to retaliate. If you ever feel the sting of rejection, and I hope you don't, you don't need to be a rejector. Jesus wasn't. He accepted all. If you see somebody rejected, it might be a nice time to say, Hi, dude. My name's Penny. How are you? Hi, dude. My name's Sally. How are you? Hi, dude. My name's Sam. How are you? Hey, dude, my name's Anthony. How are you? Jesus did not reject the rejectors. Nor should we. It's a hard one. Oh, we can talk about that later. Ready to pray? I'm going to pray over you. Dear God, may your beloved disciples, young and aging, all know of your incredible acceptance so that none of us in this room may ever be a rejecter. Bless these young ones to know you and love you more. In Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. There you go.
The first lesson is from Isaiah 45, verses 1 through 7. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places, so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light, and I create darkness. I make wheel and create woe. I, the Lord, do all these things. Our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 16, and I'll be reading the story all the way to verse 30. When he, Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless, you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, do here also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the, of the prophet Elisha, And none of them were cleansed except Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Holy God, there's nobody in this room that wants to be hurled off of a cliff. Yet we too will stand up, dear Lord, for your almighty grace shown in almighty ways far beyond these walls. For that, dear Lord, we give you thanks and ask for your blessing that these, your people, 
may hear a word from you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In this week's Old Testament reading, read so nicely by Rashmi, God says, I call you by your name, I surname you, though you do not know me. Now, the definition of surname is a hereditary name common to all members of a family, as distinct from a given name, my given name, Jane, Rushmi's given name, Rushmi. A surname is your family name connecting you to your past, where you belong, where you are known. Your, your, your heavenly surname is God's own. That's your surname, God's own. And the beauty of that surname is it is owned by millions of people. In Romans 8, 17, it says, we are, we are children of God. And if children, heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with one another, with Christ. And just before Isaiah says, I give you the treasures of darkness and the riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. I surname you. I call you by your name. You are known by God, by name, already. Earlier, two chapters before in Isaiah 43, God says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. That's God speaking. In all fairness, God is not speaking to Israel in chapter 45, our reading for today, but is speaking to Israel in chapter 43. Two different groups. In Isaiah 43, when God says, you are mine, that's the people of God. In chapter 45, when he says, I surname you, he's speaking to Cyrus, the Persian king, an outsider. For God's own reasons, Cyrus, the Persian king, was chosen by God to deliver the Israelites out of Babylon. Although Cyrus is a foreigner ignorant of Israel's God and unversed in the religion of God's people, God still speaks directly to him, assuring him, I have chosen you, I actually know you. Which is marvelous because that takes off the lid of God only knows those who call upon God's name. Because Cyrus certainly did not. Yet Cyrus ends up playing a major role in the salvation history of God's actions through God's people. Our focus is not on what Cyrus knew, but what, what God knows. Our focus is not on what Cyrus knew or understood. Our focus is on, on what God knew knows. In the church, we put a lot of emphasis, I put a lot of emphasis, on knowing God. I think it is the greatest treasure, even on Stewardship Sunday, the greatest treasure you own, knowing the God of the universe. I encourage you to worship, to pray. I encourage you to contemplation and Bible study. And I do so in the hope that you will meet and know God more, have a deeper knowledge of God, so that you will find out how much you are known and loved by God. Isaiah is letting us know that we are already known. Those of us who follow God and those who do not even know that God is using them 
like Cyrus. If God knows me by name, then God knows my story. God knows my heritage, my beginning, my end. Knowing me by name means knowing me as a person. Everybody does not know our name. Walk into a mall, how many people are going to call you by name that haven't seen the name on the card you hand them? Yet, God knows you by name. To be known by God does not require tickets. You knew I was going to get there eventually. To be known by God does not require tickets, just ask Cyrus. He certainly did not have a ticket. In the kingdom of God, tickets are not needed. They are meaningless. They are pointless. You already belong. You already are known. You are already invited. The place setting is already set. Do you remember in that film when actress Cameron Diaz played one of those heroes with ninja skills, and after being presented with a present from a handsome beau, she says, tickets, I love tickets. The thing about tickets is they are anonymous. They're a simple verification of money paid. They're a simple verification of perhaps a seat saved. In the movie clip, I refer to the ticket, the, the ticket destination is unknown, and I always thought that was the most ridiculous comment. It's not tickets, it's the destination. Are they tickets to see the Phantom of the Opera? Who's performing? What day? What time? Is it a midnight performance? Because some of us might be asleep. Tickets? They're just an indicator. They're a promoter of an event. Tickets do not care a hoot about who you are, who's sitting in the seat, which performance you chose. In fact, the promoters, once they sell you a ticket, they rather hope that you don't come so they could sell the ticket again. That empty seat may get used to ticket holders. Your identity is meaningless. So let's move to a different kind of ticket, an airline ticket. A ticket will not get you onto the plane. It does reserve a seat. And in some airlines, that seat is a chance. You will not get onto that airplane without a boarding pass. And that boarding pass must be confirmed by a photo ID. Okay, both of those can be faked. But even with an accurate photo ID, you get the place on the plane, your story is still not known. Nothing about you is known but your name. The definition of a ticket is a piece of paper or small card that gives the holder a certain right, especially the right to enter into a place, travel by public transport, participate, in, event, in, an, in an event. A ticket is a piece of paper or item. That's if you go to the mainline dictionary. If you go to the urban dictionary, a ticket, I found out, could mean a particularly high price for a house. I just bought that house for a ticket. According to the urban dictionary, that ticket is a million dollars. More so, there are four different entries on ticket being a code name for illegal drugs or alcohol, especially when somebody like me is standing around and a conversation needs to be had without my knowing anything. So if a ticket is code for illegal drugs, that might, have thrown, that might throw out of whack my entire interpretation of Cameron Diaz's comment. A ticket can also be, last on the list, a good idea. That's just the ticket. In Luke 4, in Jesus' example, he uses an example of God's presence, God's miracle, God's touch, God's healing, an unnamed widow of Zarephath, who did not have a ticket. 
Naaman, though he could have afforded one and even tried to emulate, impersonate a ticket by the equivalent of his chariots full of gifts, he did not have that little piece of paper allowing him entrance into Israel, entrance for God's miraculous healing. The widow, if you remember her story, she had that last drop of meal, that last drop of flour, for a better word, that last drop of oil. And she was out collecting a bit of twigs and firewood so that she could heat the stove and prepare her final meal for herself and her son before they both died of starvation because there was nothing else left. And the prophet Elijah came along at God's request, and said, excuse me, sister, could I have some of that bread, please? And kneeling down and picking up those twigs, she looks him in the eye and tells her story. This is it for me. This is it for my son. This is it for my name. This is it for my surname. I'm finished. I'm done. Yes, you may have the bread that I'm preparing for our final meal. Here, it's yours. She does not know what we now know after she said yes. Elijah looked at her and said, God will make sure your flour, your meal, does not run out. You will have an endless supply of both flour, meal, probably more likely uh, crushed corn, And oil, endless supply of both. You will eat and you will see God's glory, God's miraculous glory. What did the widow of Zarephath do first? She gave. Jesus also mentioned Naaman. Another story from Kings. The widow of Zarephath is in first Kings with Elijah. Naaman's story is with the prophet Elisha who interestingly enough does not appear in the scene. So General Naaman uh, up in the land of Aram, which is Syria for today, he can command all of the armies, but he cannot control the leprosy of his own skin. It's driving him nuts, as leprosy does, and will kill him. And there are three servants in this story who make the story happen. The first one is a young girl enslaved by Naaman, one presumes, definitely by the Syrians, from her home in Israel. She was captive, brought back up to Syria, serving Naaman's wife, and seeing her mistress's husband in such despair, simply says, I really wish he'd go to Israel because I know the prophets could heal him. This servant's word gets back to General Naaman, who's given permission. He goes off to Israel. He accidentally goes to the king, thinking that's where he's supposed to go. And in fact, there's a letter from the king in Syria, saying, from Aram, saying, please, would you heal my General Naaman? And the king of Israel goes into 15 conniption fits because he doesn't have the power to heal, but the general has the power to kill him. Prophet Elisha sends a message, oh, send Naaman to me. I can take care of him. So Naaman is sent to Elisha's house, and he brings his entire entourage, his chariots, his war horses, his soldiers, his servants. And they all come to the little house of the prophet. And the prophet does not even open the door and walk out. Instead, the prophet sends a messenger, a servant, our second servant. And the servant goes up to General Naaman Naaman, and says, Sir, The prophet says, you are to go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. Well, General Naaman was not a man to be put off by the little river Jordan when he had his mighty rivers back home. He throws a conniption fit. He says, I will not do it. That's just utterly ridiculous and below me. In fact, where is that prophet? Why doesn't he come and wave his arms about and show this great miraculous healing of your God? Who are you? And the third servant comes up, one of Naaman's own. One of those clearing of the throat moments. Excuse me, General. If the prophet had asked you to do something huge, would you have done it? 
Well, obviously. Then how about, why don't you do this small thing the prophet is asking? So Damon does. Naaman does. He goes off, he dips in the river, he's clean. He turns around and says, clearly there's no other God but yours. A foreigner cleaned of leprosy. This is the example Jesus used. The point of his story, telling his home congregation, Naaman, a vicious killer general, a simple widow, not from Israel. God's mission will continue with or without us. Naaman and the widow did not need tickets to see God's glory, and nor do we. Jesus' community turned on him because they wanted to control the gifts of God, make them for us only. Let's do a little rejection ourselves after years, decades, millennium of rejection. Let's reject them. They wanted to control, maybe even sell tickets. I don't know. And I'm reading into this, as you know. But do not cast blame on that community of God's people because that control that Jesus challenged has been our number one temptation all of our lives and the life of the church. We would like to control where the gifts of God's spirit will go. Clearly, it will come here. So let's buy tickets for here. That is not how it works. Cyrus, Naaman, the widow of Zarephath. So why give? You give in response to the glory of God. You do not give to receive the glory of God. Because the glory of God was given freely. We saw it on the cross, we saw it in Jesus Christ, freely given. Is this ministry something you would like to perpetuate? Your searching for meaning may have brought you here. Your searching for one more little tidbit about God may have brought you here. But do you know what keeps you here? The fact that you see the glory of God in the midst of this congregation at Northmont. As you search together, read the scriptures together, pour over the scriptures together, as you learn that your name, your surname, is God's own. Part of our understanding of discipleship is that we respond always to the glory of God. That we can do with our words, that we can do with sharing and inviting others to come to church, and that we can do by perpetuating the ministry of this, your church. The reason we do not sell tickets to church is because from the very beginning of time, God has asked for volunteers to be in relationship with him and with each other. Volunteers to witness to and see and behold the glory of God. Given, not sold. Love offered freely and in multiple ways by Jesus. What can you give? Respond to the glory of God and say yes to your many ministries here at Northmont. Tickets? Never. Love freely given, eternal. Glory to God. Amen.
Please be seated. As we come together in prayer, I know that you know of situations and people, joys or concerns that should be brought to the kingdom of God by the, by the voices of the people of God. And I invite you to name these items, these people, so that we can all rejoice with you and pray with you. And then I will close us in prayer. Holy God, we thank you for your presence in our lives. We thank you for knowing us by name, for surnaming us with your ways. Cause us to persist in your will always. Send your Holy Spirit into our hearts to rule and direct us according to your will. We are always open to receiving and encouraging scripture from you. But even in the face of the complexities of life, we promise, we pledge to follow you as your faithful, steadfast stewards. And so, dear Lord, we continue to pray for those affected by the multiple natural disasters especially the victims of the fires. We continue to pray for those traumatized by mass shootings. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We remember Priscilla. We pray for the Kelly family, the Driscoll family, Tom, for Dave in Chicago, Penny, President Trump, Vanessa, Keith, Fran, Kriti, Tammy, Howard, Dorothea, Thelma, Will, Dave, Dorothy, Cheryl, Larry, Dwayne and Liz, Jill, Frank, Annette, Kevin, John and Tammy, Betty, Barbara, Bob, Iris, Ralph, Adrian, Pam, Jack, Emmy, Jane Nicola, and James Eitler. We continue to pray for our troops, especially those from our congregation. We pray for our mission co-workers, the Ludwigs, Wellers, K-Day, and the congregation in Mangochi, that they may be witnesses with joy to your living grace. Receive these prayers of your people, Lord, those spoken and those hidden in loving hearts as we all gather our voices in community to pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward. God is the giver of life. So in celebration of God's gifts to us, may this be our time for giving back to God our time, talents, and treasures. Praise, take my hands and 
Let's pray. Father God, take what we can give to you and bless it, dear Lord, to grow your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. of God, please know that if you have feel, felt the need for prayer, that your Stephen minister will be here, is walking up the aisle now, to be present with you, to pray with you. And now, family of God, people of God, surnamed by God, feel the passion of God in your soul, and let this come out in all that you think, say, and do. In the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. 